Дорогие друзья, форум Nobel Ladies and gentlemen, Nobel Vision Open Innovations 2.0 is going on. And we are moving on to ESG track. Strict international and national legislation in the field of uh, usage of the natural resources as well as uh, trans-border carbon law is making people to move towards the green transformation. What is needed to launch the green economy on the national level? How can science help the industry to improve the movement of the reduction of the greenhouse gases emission? Please welcome to the stage. I would like to invite the moderator, Alexander Ivlev, executive partner in CIS countries of Ernst and Young. And our speakers, Viktor Vixerberg, the executive, the chairman of the supervisory board of Skolkovo Institute of Sciences and Technology, Anatoly Chubai, special representative of the President of the Russian Federation, on their communication with international organizations to achieve sustainable development. Online speakers, Raik Wong Chung, the Nobel Prize winners of the world of 2007, and Robert Metzke, the global head on sustainable development of Royal Phillips. I give floor to Alexander. Good day, dear ladies and gentlemen, and let us begin this session. The topic was very concise, and that is exactly how we are going to move from the point of view of uh, preserving our planet. And I would like to highlight that this concern for the eco situation has been reason to become the hot topic. ESG is a very relevant topic, and these are environment social governance. They are not new in the agenda, and this topic has been discussed by the community for many years. However, the topic of environment has become the top priority here and now. And it is very important from the point of view of governments. It has become clear that business is involved in this agenda as well. If we take a look at the research done by Institute of Edelman, the barometer in 2021, the community believes that the business is most reliable institute which can help to solve the ecological problems because the business is uh, transborder and transnational. They have the resources, expertise and knowledge and technologies in order to promote the agenda of ESG and to solve matters which are very difficult to solve on a separate national level especially for the nations which are fighting pandemic right now, geopolitical risks, etc. If we take a look at the countries, almost everywhere business is raising this agenda more actively. If we take a look at China, which from the point of view of ecology has never been among the top leaders, but right now 86% of the companies listed on the stock market of Shanghai are reporting according to the standards of ESG and the list of Russell 1000, the biggest uh, American companies. About 47% uh, percent of companies are reporting on, according to the standard of GRI. Europe is also changing their demands and the regulators of Europe require about 10,000 companies to consider ESG in their reporting. Next uh, year it's going to be 60,000 and I think in five years it's going to be all around Europe and it's going to be included in all the reporting requirements. The government is participating very actively in the work in this regard. On the 18th of uh, October, the Consultative uh, Council met on the foreign investments. And uh, at, according to the results, Mr. Mishustin, when he met the heads of the international companies, they have created decrees and orders according to ESG, at least uh, in regard to four or five questions, which is highlighting the importance is of this problem. Several days ago it was announced that a consortium of uh, Russian biggest companies is created and they will also promote ESG in the Russian business. About 30 participants have been included there. I'm sorry, 10, 10 participants as far as I remember. And there will be about uh, 10% of GDP covered by these companies which are going to participate in this project. I guess we should start our discussion with the first question to Mr. Chung. I will ask it in English. 
переводом на английский. Доктор uh, Чунг, uh, we obviously see that the majority of the population is deeply concerned uh, with the climate change. We can see that there are a lot of fires in the forest, we can see typhoons and a lot of things which witness significant drastic changes in the environment. And we can see that CO2, basically carbon footprint in Europe, in the world, everywhere, is increasing. Uh, and you are personally involved in interaction of the intergovernmental group of experts on the climate change. And uh, my question to you, uh, do you see any changes in the carbon footprint uh, worldwide in the environment where we face pandemic situation with COVID-19? Uh, and what has to be done to reduce the carbon footprint and to move to the next stage of the, how to say, uh, environment protection? Thank you. That's the question okay. for you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to join you. And uh, it is my great pleasure. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 uh, Omicron new uh, variant uh, virus, I could not join you personally. And it is my uh, great regret. Uh, Unfortunately, we cannot hear the speech. Regarding your question, yes, it is true that during the year 2020, when the COVID-19 struck the whole world, the uh, CO2 emission uh, re reduced a little bit like 5.4%, uh, uh, something like that. But it has rebounded immediately uh, in 2021, which is this year. It is already returning back to the level of uh, 2019, which is pre uh, the pandemic uh, emission footprint. So uh, the uh, slump or reduction of carbon footprint was very temporary and short-lived, and uh, our carbon footprint is uh, rebounding quickly, and uh, even we are, have to worry about, it might even go further increase in the years to come, in spite of the uh, commitment and agreement at the Glasgow Climate Conference. There has been, encouragingly, it's good to note that many governments made the very strong commitments there. But uh, until these commitments are translated into real action, I think uh, we still have a lot of time to see whether we can really make the big change needed to limit the global warming to 1.5 or 2 degree. Um, UN report saying that if we continue as we are doing now, we will end up at best 2.5 degree uh, warming and we are very much off the course and off the schedule uh, of meeting the target for 1.5 degree. Uh, in order to meet the target of 1.5 degree Celsius, we have to reduce 7.6% of carbon footprint every year. But even the pandemic just gave us a little bit of a slump or only 5% which means that we have to reduce our carbon footprint even much more than even the coronavirus pandemic has uh, infected, uh, impacted upon us, which means that we have to reduce even further than the pandemic has uh, imposed upon us. So this is a huge pressure and task. And uh, if I continue to uh, the second question uh, about how best we can reduce the carbon footprint. Then I think uh, one of the most important uh, issue is the governments, including Russia and the major economies around the world, should take up reducing carbon footprint as a policy for industrial competitiveness, rather than just the climate and the environmental policy. We have to look at this carbon footprint reduction, which is reducing CO2 emission, should be regarded as a very important component of future industrial strategy and also economic growth strategy and job creation strategy. We should not look at it only as an extra burden and cost on the economy. Rather, we have to look at it as a new opportunity for economic growth industrial competitiveness and job creation. So unless we take up 
climate change issue in such a positive uh, perspective, it might be very difficult for any government or society and business to take a very strong action because it's very difficult for any government or business to take a strong action only for, for the sake of a climate action. But if you look at it as a very important strategy for industrial competitiveness and uh, job creation, then I think it will be a very different story. So I'm strongly uh, promoting the new approach and new idea that green growth, which means that economic growth can be stimulated by the actions for CO2 emission reduction. This, this new paradigm of green growth has been, I've been proposing this idea since 2005, already 16 years ago. I was pushing this idea from the UN and uh, for a long time. This idea has been a little bit uh, introduced to some of the governments. Some years ago in 2019, I believe, I remember that even President Putin mentioned the green growth at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. So it is very important for the government and business and people to look at this uh, climate change issue from a new growth, economic growth strategy from the perspective of a green growth. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wechselberg, Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology has been created a decade ago, and uh, it feels like it was yesterday. And right now it's an innovative center which is respected and renowned all over the world and all over the Russian. Skoltech is among top 50 young innovative in universities of the world, and your company, group of companies, Renova, is working actively in field of uh, solar panels in Russia. So you are creating the equipment for generation, you are building the electric stations, power stations, which are using renew, uh, renewable energy sources. And the question to you, what technologies and practices are allowing you to decrease the carbon footprint and how the companies, which are actually ruining the nature in this way. So how can they solve this problem and reduce their negative effect on the ecology? And what role of science is given to this process of transferring to the carbon neutrality? Thank you for the question. Before I answer, I would like to make a little remark in regards of the whole environmental agenda, how the world is treating the problem, how our state is treating the problem. I think that for all of you, if you look back, it would be quite obvious that uh, two or three years passed since the moment when the amount of carbon dissidents in our country in particular was, I'm talking about the active ones, was in abundance. They have been actually promoting the idea that the carbon agenda, the environmental agenda, is a matter of discussion because there have to be analysis done, this research, the experiments. We need to prove that the millions of years of our history of Earth cannot allow us to make some conclusions on the inevitability of the result and that the dominance of the effect of this uh, process is due to anthropological actions. These discussions were seen on all, of, all over the place. And there was an idea that our state, our government, is still not ready to make a final decision, a decisive move, and to join the world's trends, which we see 
which we saw then. But during the shortest period of time, and I believe that uh, Mr. Chubais will speak a bit more about this, judging by his position here and now, we saw a very important transformation occurring in the country. And I would like to highlight, I guess that you know, so we are attending this Nobel Forum. This year's two physicians, Hasselman and Banamba, have won the prizes. But actually it was with some weird editing or revision, if I recall it correctly, for innovative interpretation of complicated physical processes. Although, in fact, these are the scientists who have been conducting their work for more than 40 years, and they prove using their models that climatic transformation considering the carbon footprint is an objective reality and supercomputers also helped to prove and scientifically prove the inevitability of these processes reverse irreversibility of these processes as well that is why the forum which took place recently the world un forum which actually stated the fact, reiterated this fact of this treatment of this problem by the world civilization and uh, created particular vectors. It, that was the summarization of the whole discussion whether this problem exists or not. But what actually happened after that? I think you have been monitoring the situation as well. The most active discussion is how much is going to cost, how many trillions have to be spent to overcome the challenges and the problems and the obligations which have been taken up by each government in this regard. And the conclusions, which are not too clear and obvious in this case, is that the price which has to be paid by us, Russia in particular, for this carbon neutrality is unbearable. It is too expensive. It is going to lead to unexpected social results. That is why we need to treat it with great care and I haven't seen, for example, the analysis of the last year, and I don't know what are the alternatives. What are the results which we will face, which the civilization will face, if we do nothing? In this case, we're talking about the climate change and the global warming, and we do not know what global cataclysms will occur and what we will have to pay for this alternative. From my point of view, we don't have this choice, either or. We have this only option. We have to do this, and that's it. No discussion anywhere else. So, but where is the answer lying? So, and uh, in our group of companies, in our perimeter, the answer is rather simple. It's the efficiency of using the technologies of reducing the carbon footprint. It's the investment into the technological solutions which help to solve this problem. The perimeter of our group is showing two companies which are doing this directly. Havel group of companies which is developing and producing technological solutions in the field of uh, solar generation and the Cifra company, which is, so you know Cifra is a digit in English, so it's using digital platforms to implement technological solutions, which will reduce the emissions due to changing the technological processes. If we are talking about the achievements, 
uh, which are borne by us, we should talk about the work on the increase of the efficiency of the companies, the heat generation, reduction of coal generation, and this was a significant field of development for us during the last few years. And during the last five years, we managed to decrease the amount of emissions in the field of uh, reduction of uh, coal generation by 40 percent. So, and uh, I've began to speak about the technology. And yes, that's the main part here. We have the breakthrough technologies, interruptive technologies, which help us to catch, to store, to increase the efficiency of these emissions. And we have next generation technological solutions. But I would like to highlight the role of Skoltech in this case. I'm really glad for the international cooperation that's we foster in the active cooperation between scientific communities of all the countries to solve this problem. Recently, I heard a saying of one of the Nobel winner, Nobel Prize winners, who said the following. After the conference, we shifted to the new paradigm, to the new international order. This is a new international competition. The strongest will win, the weakest will lose. And this actually instilled some concerns into me, because I thought the Nobel Prize winner is talking about this, then I guess this is the reality. I'm not talking about the impartial and objective comments that we saw that this is going to be the competition of economies. We need to understand this. We need to be conscious about this. We don't have extra time to do this. We need to do it fast, but the scientific potential of our country is going to allow us to be among the leaders of this competition. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have another question then right away. And does business actually expect some support from the government, from the state, in the development of the technologies which are going to allow us to reduce the carbon emissions and to improve the ecological situation? You know, I believe that the part played by the government should be regarded in several aspects, especially on the initial level. First of all, we are part of global economy, and it is of utmost importance to achieve understanding with our international colleagues. We have to play according to the same rules and same standards. The rules have to be unified. Otherwise, if it doesn't happen like this, it will be developed into various aspects. How to measure things, how to consider things, how to evaluate, how to assess the climatic uh, projects and their success, how we should uh, assess the tools such as climatic certificates, etc. All of these elements of the support, they have to be there, they have to be synchronized with all the rules and approaches which exist in the international economy. Otherwise, we as export-oriented economy, which is a part of global economy, we might lose significantly. Second part, of course, it is expensive. Yes, no doubt about it. That is why we need resources. And such resources could be various measures of support from the government and the state. In the energy, this could be the approaches to wind energy, to all the alternative generation. Usually, these fields are regulated through tariffs and rates. That is why, if we're talking about green technologies, there have to be some advantages in this regard. We're talking about the financial support, subsidies for the 
loan rates for the green projects, etc., etc. And of course, the rules, normative rules, procedures which have to be followed, which have to be set for a long period of time. And we shouldn't change these rules. Because if we try to try to put it into some particular economic situation, then it's going to be a very expensive in the long run. Because there is a Russian saying that a greedy man pays twice. So that is why we need to start working faster than with what we do now. I do agree with you on this uh, from the point of view that business can work uh, in any conditions and we are ready to move uh, according with the government and the state to solve the tasks together and we need to have strict rules and they have to be constant for a very long time of their actions. Mr. Chubais, you have been working in this field on an international level, intergovernmental level. You have studied this matter, but many people are asking the question, so what is actually happening with this uh, transfer to new energy? What is the situation in our country? And people are asking question, how exactly this process is going to influence a regular entrepreneur, the Russian business and Russian companies? And and I would like to chase this question with the following. The renewable energy in Russia, what is happening to it in Russia and what can we expect in the nearest future? Thank you. These are very large scale questions actually. And what I think is that we need to simplify things when we try to answer these questions. We need to simplify them, otherwise we will drown in the complexity of these questions. But to simplify them, we need to answer the question, what is actually the this energy transference. I think that we need to compare it to something what we already know, what we have been through already. The sphere on the globe, so the technical sphere is information, energy and so basically nothing else. So the transport which we are using, the microphones, the this is information, energy and materials. This is all about those. But it's happened so that we have a unique and extraordinary occurrence, which is the informational revolution. So I think everybody remembers the first PC that we received, the computer, the first tablet, the first mobile phone. Well, I personally remember how I called uh, from Leningrad, from St. Petersburg nowadays, to Moscow, and I was told that I can do this only at, uh, in the period of time from 8 in the morning until 5 in the evening. So, yeah, it was impossible. So, right now you can just pull out the cell phone and you can call Moscow, St. Petersburg, New Zealand, the U.S. I'm not talking about the changes in the business, how great they are. I'm not talking about the governmental changes. This is revolution. Information 30 years ago compared to the information today are absolutely different worlds. So you're asking how they affected the humankind? Well, they, the changes were immense. They have changed how we live, how we host our meetings, conferences, etc. They have changed the business, the deepest of utmost deep changes. I believe that right now we are one step from the beginning of the same scale process, but it's not going to be in information fields, it's going to be in the energy fields. I think that within the next cycle, about 30 years, we are going to review all the basic principles. And I'm not talking about electric energy, I'm talking about the industry, I'm talking about the transport, about the agriculture, about construction, the way of our lives. We are talking about all the fields where an energy occurs. Everything will be fundamentally changed. This is going to change the life of each one of us. This is going to change almost every business. I've just mentioned the fields uh, of business activities. This is going to change the lives of big companies, of small companies. So this is not my exactly my idea. So just recently Bill Gates was asked, what does this energy transference remind you of? And he said, this actually reminds the first years of the computer era. 
And definitely this guy knows what he's talking about. He said that there will be thousands of thousands of startups and thousands of them will die out. There will be super successful companies. The current top leaders with capitalization of trillions and more, Amazon and Google, will be replaced by other companies. And that is going to occur in less than 50 years. I actually think that is going to occur in the next 30 years. And in order for it to happen like that, the, few, the 10 years are going to be the key ones. If we're talking about the Russian Federation, how it looks here, so of course we are much more vulnerable to this process compared to anybody else. All countries have energy production, but for Russia it's a backbone industry. It's a part of our, it's a backbone of national economy, 20% of GDP, 40% of federal revenues, and 60% of exports. So it, it is very important. So we are very vulnerable on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have colossal opportunities. Besides the fact that energy transitions, I think, will change all industries in real sector in the country. It also provides opportunities to create a sectors or industries that never existed before. I think there will be five to ten new industries that the country had never had before. My, that's my personal estimation. Exports of hydrogen from Russia by 2030 may be amounted to 50 billion dollars. I think that's very realistic and achievable. It's not there yet. In that respect, the, de the depth of, trend of changes is uh, very major. All our, of our lives will be touched, and we are only one step away from that. If we talk about renewables, of course it is an important part of energy transition, but it's not everything. I think renewables it's about 5% from all those things that will happen in Russia uh, as part of energy transition. Of course, it's the core, it's the driver, and five years ago we didn't have it. And when Victor, we were promoting this situation, others looked at us like, you are crazy. In Russia, renewables, so wind generation? No, that's not possible. And that's not true. Well, Russia has renewable energy sources. We have generation, we have industry, we have science, and we have education. All the four elements of that cluster are in place and at key stages it was quite difficult while it was all being created uh, with, with, with Prime Minister uh, Mr. Medvedev we worked with him he helped to change the trends and when recently when we discussed um, the, what will happen with new bulls in 2031 and Mr. Mishustin played a major role and we see some results already once that was defined a tender took place and probably you understand so what is capacity uh, so that helped to reduce uh, prices for wind and solar generation two and three times respectively so, but this is about real business so we reach the one kilowatt um, hour for tenders is at the level of best global uh, levels and it's better to coal generation and it becomes closer to cogeneration. So prospects are colossal in Russia. We are number one in the world in terms of wind potential, number one, especially in the north and far east, where they have not even started with this. Russia has colossal potential in terms of solar, so insulation in Chelyabinsk is uh, more than in Berlin, and Berlin is one of global leaders in renewables. So we have colossal opportunities. And our hydrogen industry, green hydrogen, uh, is also, also leads to other green um, technologies. Only in Far East, we will need to put on line uh, of renewable capacities of four 
100,000, 40,000 megawatt, including nuclear generation, which is a very important. Of the, it's very important for this green transition. I think the world will recognize that one day. Hydro generation and solar and wind. So this is what will be done as part of creating a um, hydro, hydrogen cluster in the Far East. And there will be major changes taking place in Russia. So we are only one step away from that major change. And the key thing that happened in our country in this larger um, uh, Top with this larger topic of energy transition. Believe me, the hardest thing in those processes is a goal setting. So you should have a goal, an objective in the beginning. And a lot of our elite thought that that agenda was foreign agenda, not an unfriendly agenda. We know how to work, we'll continue to produce what we already produce. But fortunately, as, it, as we have seen this uh, in Russia, the government is the most European part. The authorities made the decision to set their goal. And we are all aware of that. The president announced uh, that Russia will reach carbon neutrality no later than 2060. And uh, there is a low, low carbon strategy until 2050 uh, with all the key parameters in place and and if we want to for the economy to grow if we want for retirement benefits to grow if we want uh, army to receive uh, modern arms and uh, decent work there's only one way to go it's a green growth so that's part of those decisions that have been adopted in the country Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We are joined by Robert Netsky, head of the Group for Sustainable Development in Philips. Hello, question for you. Your company has worked for many years in healthcare. You develop technologies in that area. You work specifically on strategies, ESG strategies in your company, and from what I understand, ESG has been incorporated as part of your corporate culture in Philips. You have very ambitious goals by 2030 to provide access uh, to good medicine to 400 million people on planet, and you want to improve the quality of life of 2.5 billion people on our planet. So those are very ambitious objectives. So can you tell us, so what about carbon neutrality? Is it part of your company strategy and human health and sustainable development? How do they relate to each other? Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure being here, and thanks for your question. Um, of course, decarbonization is a core part of, uh, of our strategy um, because uh, climate change and global health are very much connected. You know that the World Health Organization has uh, said that the Paris Climate Treaty was the most important healthcare treaty of the 21st century. Uh, we know also at the same time it's not only climate that is affecting healthcare um, and the health of the populations, it is also the healthcare industry that is affecting climate, so it goes both ways. We know that the healthcare systems in the world are emitting more carbon dioxide than all airlines or all shipping lines together. So something needs to change, and that's why decarbonization is also a core part of our strategy. Since last year, we are already operating carbon neutral in all countries around the world, uh, including Russia. We use 100% renewable electricity for our operations. We have signed up to science-based targets, one and a half degrees, and we have just issued a pledge and a commitment to also invite our suppliers. In the next four years, we want to have at least 50% of our global suppliers also sign up to science-based targets to really help them reduce emissions in the entire supply chain. Of course, we are really trying to work with hospitals and leading care providers to get the emissions per treatment uh, to levels that are compatible with the Paris Treaty. Let me stop here uh, as a first opening. 
Спасибо большое. Вопрос. Thank you very much for that. So, so question for a corporate question. Your KPI system for employees. Does it take into account any things related to the fact that they, that they contribute personally to this environmental agenda, which is a company's agenda, or it doesn't have to do anything with how they are rewarded? Yes, it is fully embedded, um, and incentives is part of that. So um, sustainable, our sustainability goals are really part of the company strategy. That's why they come back also in the um, way how we drive performance management. So we have company targets. They are, uh, you mentioned already, the, the long-term targets for 2030. We have targets for 2025. We have annual targets, and they're cascaded through all parts of the company, and they're part of the monthly, quarterly, and annual performance cycle. Um, these incentives um, are also part of our long-term incentive schemes for all executives uh, and, let's say, the top 5,000 of our 80,000 employees. Um, also, the long-term incentive scheme has, is, uh, is tied to meeting uh, the sustainability and the ESG targets uh, in the company. But I would argue transforming a company uh, of our size has not only to do with the incentives that you set in terms of remuneration, but it's also really about a joint narrative, a story that people can relate to it. It's about empowering people. It's about providing the right training, the knowledge, um, and it's about really embedding what we do in the core processes. So we talk here at an innovation center, Skolkovo. Um, so really making sure that you drive portfolio management, innovation management, not just from a financial perspective, but also from a social um, and environmental impact perspective. It's really core of how we drive this. So for instance, our core processes to develop products, let's uh, call it PDLM process, um, that has many different stage gates. And these stage gates, we really have embedded sustainability. Uh, and right now, 70% of all our products are designed according to an eco-design program, and that will be 100% uh, by 2025. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Viktor Felixovich, I have a question for you. So do you believe that partnerships between major companies in the area of development strategies or developing new technologies, partnerships not only in Russia but across the globe may provide have a major impact on what is happening with the environment and how it can be organized from your perspective? It's a difficult question because undoubtedly we live in a competitive world, but there's this notion uh, of the best practice. So cooperation or collaboration between large companies, if they are open uh, to cooperate and they have clear goals, it is a way for best practices to become accessible to us, for us to implement them. And we can share our successes with others. It's a way to resolve those problems. I understand that we are running out of time, but I will go a little bit over time, but still. Uh, when we opened this session, you said about ESG, and I would like to talk not so much about the E, but I would like to say a few words about S, social responsibility is about principles in the company that ensure a set of social support measures for our employees primarily. That regulate processes of interaction with clients, with suppliers, when we follow specific guidelines. But I would like to go one step further when we talk about social responsibility. We talk about people of a different generation. We talk about 50s and 60s, about those years. But those problems will be resolved by those who are 10 or 20 years. And these people have different uh, worldview. They have different approaches. And Greta is not an abstraction for them. It's not a, just a symbol, but it's living person with this ideology. So even today we face this. When people um, want to join our company, young candidates, 
asks us what principles our company follows and it's uh, if they don't fit with their perspectives with what is being declared as part of ESG, then those people will not join us. They will, and they will not be buying products from us if they're not confident that the company follows those values. And we would like to do it in our university, and this is what we already do, The people who deal with those research problems or who work in education, they keep in their mind this main thought they will live in a different world and they need to preach other values so this human capital uh, issue and how do you improve human capital it's a very important question it's just as important or even more important than those decisions made by the state or the companies thank you so much for that we have very little time left but i have a question for all the participants of this session in fact it's a very interesting experiment and your answers to this question will put in a time capsule that will be put aside and opened in a year, in 2022. And we will see how much your answers are in line with future events over the course of the next year. And we will be able to take a look how the world will have changed in 12 months. So here's the question for all the participants of this discussion. We all see that the world of technologies transforms our lives quickly. What innovation or what, which new technology can drastically change human life? It can be implemented in 2022. I would like to ask, uh, to repeat that in English, just in case. The question is for the same, the same question for everyone. Basically, we will open up a special, how to say, box in one year time to see which answers were closest to the reality. The question is, which uh, scientific invention or new technology will radically change life of the humanity during 2022? So in that case, let's, uh, Dr. Tum, uh, over to you, please. Okay. Uh, uh, I could not listen to, because of the technical problem, I could not listen to the uh, translation. But uh, regarding your question, I think the carbon capture and storage and the hydrogen production technology will be uh, very critical and i think there will be a big uh, improvement uh, next year and it, it, it will have i believe it might have a big impact on carbon neutrality next year thank you very much Victor. So you asked, uh, you gave us a little time uh, how much uh, life will change in 2022. I think that those problems uh, that we are facing today as a civilization with the pandemic, etc., I think this discovery will have to do with something uh, with uh, me medicine and healthcare, I cannot tell you what it is exactly, but something uh, will happen that will drastically change the life, the lives of our, all, all of us. Thank you so much for that, Anatoly. So that was very treacherous on your part because forecasting is always difficult, but you'll be checking our answers in a year. You'll do that. That's kind of nightmarish. Okay, it seems to me that focus, current focus is on energy, energy efficiency. But I think the next step, the, sec the next uh, stage will be the so-called uh, material in, uh, efficiency, because we can build this, uh, make this building twice as light, and it will require uh, twice as little um, energy for to deliver 
building blocks here. So I think uh, potential of energy transition in materials is just as large when we talk about just pure energy. So to respond to your question, so if you talk about niche or, or if you talk about platform technology, I have this uh, answer I can provide with confidence. So I, I think it's a nano tubes and that will make it possible to make uh, current materials uh, much, much stronger. So the global leader is the Russian company Axial, and next year that technology and that company will have a breakthrough on the global level. Thank you so much for that. Robert, now over to you. Same question. So what will be invented in the world in 2022? Uh, something that will radically change the w life of all of us. Uh, you are a guest. Yes, thank you. Um, I believe that we see a large-scale implementation of uh, digital and AI technologies that enable that will really fundamentally continue to dri drive, for instance, how we organize healthcare and how society is organized. That will have also drastic impact on uh, carbon emissions. Think of uh, efficiencies, the uh, way how we organize patient streams, uh, logistical streams around the world, and so forth. But um, I also wanted to refer to what uh, Mr. Chubai said. I think half of the emission reductions need to come from circular models. So we need to move away from a linear economy where we make stuff and then throw it away. We need to find ways where we can reuse materials, components. And that is innovation, not in a technological sense, but it is also, but it is also an evolution of how we uh, drive business models. So from transaction and from selling products to moving to services. And I believe next year we will see a huge step up of companies and governments embracing circular economy principles towards the COP27. It seems to me we had a very interesting discussion today. The topic has, has many facets to it because ESG is three components, like we say, environment, social, and governance. And as I stated before, 20 years ago when I visited World Economic Forum at Davos, so we had used to different used, used to be governance number one. So, so operational activities and governance were number one. How to manage your business social was number two, and environment at that time it it was a number uh, three uh, solidly. Of course, it was discussed. Um, by global leaders, politicians, historians, and all the others. So we have a different order of these letters, So, but it's the same topic. This is part of the agenda for the corporations and for the governments. Hopefully, we'll be able to protect our planet and ensure good future for our children. Thank you for participation, and I'll, see, I'll hope to see you again.
Единый транспортно-логистический холдинг «Российские железные дороги». Мы развиваем транспортную инфраструктуру страны, строим новые станции, вокзалы и создаем новые возможности для вашего бизнеса. Лучшие скоростные и высокоскоростные поезда сделают ваше путешествие комфортным и безопасным. Мы – локомотив экономики. Сотни миллионов тонн грузов ежегодно. Развитие науки и социальной сферы – это наш вклад в благосостояние страны и вашу уверенность в завтрашнем дне. Есть история фантастическая. Есть история сказочная. Есть страшная история. А есть история реальная. В Юка всегда реальная история и диагностика автомобилей с пробегом. Юка – официальный сервис Hyundai. Смотрите историю и диагностику автомобиля и покупайте его онлайн.
If you want to stay ahead of the competition, you need the most advanced solutions to transform your comms performance. From media database to social influencers, distribution to monitoring, analytics to insights, Sijin's cloud-based tools can help you communicate like never before. Звонки ВКонтакте для работы. Больше никаких ограничений по времени и платных функций. Звонки ВКонтакте — это разговоры без конца.